Here at Stodge Face, we take our baking seriously. And we're not talking about the Panny de Banana bread type baking. We're talking American style, original recipe, hard to come by, donut frying, cupcake styling baking. And we have done our research. Try it for yourself. We insist. Open weekdays from 10 a.m. and weekends from 12 p.m. We only close when the shelves have been emptied. We are currently located in Irish Town Athlone and our new Tullamore based venture is coming soon. So watch this space. We are people friendly, dog friendly, and COVID friendly. We are Stodge Face. Broadcasting live from the little town of Clara County Offaly, it's What's the Story with Lloyd Bracken. Get in touch today through all our social channels and have your say. Oh, and thanks for listening. Now it's over to you, Lloyd. What's the story? Hi everyone, very welcome back. What's the story with myself, Lloyd Bracken? Hope you're all in good form and your January is going not too bad. How is lockdown going for everybody? Um, Just want to say congratulations to Vincent Devine who unveiled a fantastic piece of artwork on the Late Late Show last Friday night and all proceeds from that painting, it will be auctioned of course uh, in due course and all proceeds will go to Heroes Aid which is a fantastic charity and uh, all the best of course to Vicky Phelan as well who heads stateside for more treatment and we wish her well. Also thanks for all the downloads and feedback from Raheen FM oh yeah, very own radio station here in Raheen. It's nice to hear from some of our local artists who we might not hear from that often so I plan to do that once a month at the start of every month and plus I'm going to have a new co-host on that show on Raheen FM every month. If you'd like to get in touch with the show or to leave a request or maybe we play a song for you, uh, you can email me at littletownmedmed at gmail.com or get in touch through Facebook on the Little Town Media page. Right, we're back to basics here this week. We have a guest with us, uh, socially distanced, of course, behind Perspex screens and all that sort of stuff. All safety precautions have been taken here and uh, it's a pleasure to have this guest in studio with me tonight. He's done so much for Clara Town and beyond and uh, we're going to have a chat with him. We've so much to get through. Frank Fury, what's the story? Lloyd, how are you doing? Thank you very much for joining me in Raheen. It's brilliant. It's like coming home. <laughs> Frank, firstly, like when I research some people for podcasts, I sometimes say, God, there's a second podcast here somewhere, maybe a third, and you're no exception. We'll try and get through as much as we can. Firstly, as I said, everyone, take me back, elaborate if you can. What are your earliest childhood memories? You said you lived in the 12 cottages for a time. Where were they? Mm, 12 cottages. Uh, we're all condemned. And were, um, do you know where the poly factory is? You do, yeah. Yeah. There were 12 colleges there, and each one had a, had its own tree. I was about five when we left the 12 colleges. My my memory of it was really warm and comfortable. Now, there were dry toilets. We had no running water. There was a pump. I just remember outside our door, it was always very slippy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so from the 12 colleges, Frank, you didn't venture too far away over to Marion Square? Oh, Marion Square. What a fabulous place to grow up. I remember, I remember our going up there, and I remember my mother saying, "Jesus, I'll never be able to furnish this. It's too big." My grandparents, my maternal grandparents, Rosanna and Jimmy Kelly, they also lived in the twelve colleges, but they moved in with us when we uh, when we moved. They moved. Give us a sense, Frank, of what Marion Square was like moving in with your grandparents as well and your four sisters. You know, you went to bed at night time with your legs. Sore. You were always running. You were always doing something. In later years, you were running away from a beating. But it was just, I grew up in Centre Parks. It was an amazing place to grow up. We had everything. Marion Square had everything. We had the pond with the hills. We'd go by this dump at night time. We'd books Englishes for, for playing cards. We swapped books and we played soccer in the soccer field with the lads off the early shift. It was amazing. Like for a lot of people who mightn't even have met their grandparents, but for someone like yourself who has lived with your grandparents, who was the parents in the household, Frank? My grandparents were very quiet and very far removed from the day to day. They had nothing really to do with it. My memory is that they sat each side of the fireplace. I don't ever remember my grandfather talking. He was an alcoholic. He was in no way offensive or he was in no way difficult. But he met you at the door on your way home from school every day and sent you back down to 
Tom Daly's for two large battles again. I remember my way back at Meet Jimmy Dunn. He was doing the same run. It was a conveyable system. Tell me about your parents, Frank. Let's start with your dad first, Mick Fury. My dad came from Raheen, just down the road from where you are now. He was in the army. The army was his pride and joy. And he had to leave the army around 54, I think, 1954, because my granddad was bedridden. Uh, He was uh, arthritic and totally immobile. So my father had to come home and help to to care for him. My father had one sister and one brother. Uh, My mother uh, came from Clash of One. She had two sisters and a brother. So your mother, your mother is Lizzie? Lizzie Kelly, yeah. So there's a, a Lizzie Fury in the family now, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. it's brilliant, absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And I don't know if that was intentional, but I was delighted when I heard it, you know? Yeah, it's good news, yeah. Mm. Four sisters, Liz, Rosanna, Bernadette and Mary. What was it like in a house full of, of women, Frank? Very difficult. Now, Liz would be offended if you named her first because I would suggest she's the oldest. She's not. <laughs> I blame Derek for giving me the names in that order. <laughs> Rosanna is the oldest. She lives in Wexford, in Gorey. Uh, she's married to a fellow from the Green, a lad from the Green, uh, Sean Cushion. Liz is married to a Pascal Sweeney in Tullamore. Barr is married to Jimmy Kelly in Tullamore. And Mary is married to Tom Conway in Clanchani. You might mention some of the other families <laughs> that was in Marion Square at the time for people who might not uh, know. Gunnar Welsh lived in Seven. Gunnar Welsh collected books. He had really good classic books. He didn't like to swap books. It was full of personalities, just full of personalities. There was a bishop living in Marion Square. Oh, well. Yeah. He actually ordained Sinead O'Connor. There's yeah. news for some people now. A lot yeah. of people, I would I would imagine. Yeah, well, Marion Square was no at all. You know, like, well, we had the Brackens there, obviously, of course. Oh, the, <laughs> oh, the Brackens. <laughs> Bra- there were Brackens. There were two families of Bracken, and both of them were into gardening, and they had stunning gardening gardens. And uh, Rose Bracken won the Garden of the Year one year. Her creation was red and white. Our side of the road had no sunshine, so we couldn't even grow muck. <laughs> We couldn't even grow a hedge. We had a dwarf hedge when everybody else had four foot of a hedge. <laughs> Both your parents worked separate shifts, didn't they, in the factory? What yeah. Was, it, like, was that kind of uh, reared by your, your father during the day and reared by yeah, your mother now? absolutely. It was, um, my mother had this awful dread and fear. She kind of lived with most of her life that she would die on me a baton. So <laughs> going out in the mornings, going to school in the mornings, most parents would give you a hug. I got a clatter. I usually said, what's it for? And I was told, it's for what you're going to do. <laughs> she, she had this, and she also had an arsenal of weapons. The most powerful one was a wet dish cloth. She used it like Kit Carson. She could snare you from, from 20 yards. My father was awful quiet. We hated when he was on the late shift because that meant he made, he made your lunch for school. Now, your lunch consisted of bread, butter and jam. That was on a good day. But he'd wrap it in newspaper so you could read it as well as eat it. <laughs> so it was, uh, his standards of hygiene weren't great. Right. You mentioned to me before at separate times in your childhood, your parents spent long times in hospital at different times. There were two periods where I, I distinctly remember. My mother was in hospital for about seven weeks at one stage with pleurisy. My father worked. Now at that time, they worked five and a half days a week in Gubbity's. He had my grandparents to look after. That, they were his in-laws. He had us to look after. He had a job to go to. On a Saturday, he would get in to see my mother on a Saturday afternoon. That was probably on a bicycle. It was horrible. The house was horrible without her. And then my father ended up on another time in hospital for seven weeks. And he had, well, we were told he had a slip disc. It was dreadful. You know, like she could only get in on a Saturday as well. And she used to get a lift. So they were two really black periods in our house. For them periods, it must have been good, though, being in Marion Square and, and people rallying round. And, of course, the, the factory would have been good as well. People maybe doing a little bit of fundraising that you mightn't have been aware of. You know, Lloyd, if somebody asked me when I was a kid, were we poor or were we rich? I would have honestly answered, I don't know, because everybody was the same as us. But I do remember my father was in hospital and a knock came to the door one Sunday night. And my mother came in crying. It was kind of scary because they didn't cry in front of you. We had won first prize in the silver circle. It was £20, which was an enormous sum of money. And about a week later, we won a hamper. 
So it must have been close enough to Christmas. And this was an amazing hamper. Even then, I must have been seven or eight, I wasn't gullible enough to think that it was a run of good luck. I just figured that somebody was after giving us the hamper. Somebody, some charity was after looking out for us. Or Goodbody's was known. Goodbody's workers were incredible. To work in Goodbody's, and every week there was a collection. I often suspected that it came from Goodbody's or Goodbody's department or like at seven and eight to think like you did that maybe you said you weren't gullible. Were you always like that? Were you always oh, yeah. an old head on young shoulders back then? No, no. I, I was kind of sharp. I, 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 I was sharp in the sense that if I thought it was a cause of worry in the house, I'd be aware of it. Did I know we were broke or did I know we, we had nothing? Absolutely not. Never. Like it, it, Nobody my age would have known whether things were tough or not or whether things were hard or not. I just presumed the war. What about the mid-60s and the factory was going bad and your mother had a plan? <laughs> <laughs> you talked to Derek too much. <laughs> My mother was there. Uh, she was just a great woman, just tinkling her feet. She decided we were all going to emigrate to Dundee. All right? Beautiful, sunny place. <laughs> yeah, like it was downtown Dundee we were going to. And we were going to Dundee. And I don't remember a conversation between herself and my father about it, other than herself and my sisters and two two of her nieces took sail to Dundee. And uh, Dundee was the capital of jute manufacturing in, in the UK. And Clara was the capital in Ireland. So apparently there was plenty of work in Dundee. And she had a cousin over there. She would have referred to her on, on and off as an antichrist. Uh, but, <laughs> she had a, but she had a house got for us. And we were going over there and there was plenty of work. But myself and my father stayed working in good beliefs. Now, every slick of furniture had been sold at this late. Now, we were in a bed. And that was it. There was nothing left in the house. <laughs> two mugs, I think. I don't know why we needed two. But we, she, she didn't. She got rid of everything. And we were about four days, they were gone about four days, and this telegram came. Don't sell, stop. We're not staying, Mick, stop. But I'll stay an extra week. <laughs> so she turned it into a holiday. A telegram, that tells you then about the time. Yeah. The telegram arrived. But we came, they came back, and it was the very same as if nothing had happened. <laughs> she, uh, she just went ahead and just stuck the house again and... Furnished the house again and moved on. My father just rambled in and out and he said... So I get from the story then you got your organisational skills then from your man. <laughs> without a doubt. Without a doubt, she was brilliant at planning and organising. We went on holidays for two weeks every year to Tremor in a mobile home. Fancy now that. Oh yeah, that's not about being well off. But she brought the next door neighbours, Bridgie and Maggie Berry, who were... Oh, we're single women, mature women. And Horn, Ray Horn. He, uh, Ray Horn got a free holiday now, he did. Get your more. Oh, yeah, I suppose he did. <laughs> yeah, he got many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, tell us about your school life and I suppose your early school life. Uh, primary school was brilliant. We were never afraid. Our class was never afraid going into school. What do you mean by that now, afraid? Was there other classes going in that were afraid? Oh, yeah. Of what? Like? Uh, a good beating. You know, like, uh, when people talk about corporal punishment now, they think of a slap on the hand or something. We used to get a shit beat now of us. But we were in with a teacher, uh, a Mr. Mac, Mr. McNamara, who never raised his voice to us, never reminded his hand. So I was awful lucky. We were with him until fifth class. I think there were 42 in our class. Some of the brightest, brainiest guys you could meet were there. Uh, like Ray Horn was uh, We started school together. Both of us were three when we started school. I think his mother was as anxious to get rid of him as he, as mine was to get three rid of me. Three years of age now is very, very young. In today's standards, yeah. maybe five, six in some cases. I think my mother saw me running out uh, in front of a car. Now, a car would pass our house probably every three weeks or something. And I happened to run out. I think he was a hackney man, Joe Guinan. They got out and they were looking under the car for me and I was hiding behind the wall because I knew this is it. Debt warmed up. But, uh, she, she hunted me off to school and uh, I loved it. So take me then on to secondary school then. Was, was that an equal love? The first year was grand. The second year, I absolutely hated place. 
uh, there were some pretty bad beatings. And there were, um, there was a teacher that made us, that made me feel that he looked down on us. We were factory kids. Not all, not, not everybody in the class was a factory kid. But you always felt, maybe I was the only one that felt that. I felt that he frowned on us. He looked down on us. And uh, the laugh was there was nothing in Clara other than what was put there by the factory workers or, or by the people. And uh, Gubbidius was an, um, a really good employer. I'm sure there are thousands of people who will disagree with me, but my experience and my family's experience was we had a very secure income. Like anything that was built in Clara, Gubbidius funded it through the workers or through their social club or whatever. That secondary school experience didn't last too long, Frank, did it? Uh, myself and Ray Horn, like, we, we we hung out together. He was like the rest of us. He was good at some subjects and excellent at others. We decided we would mitch one Friday afternoon from the tech. And then we mitched on Monday. And for about three weeks, we mitched. We were kind of brazen enough about it. We would walk the railway to Ballycumber and ask anyone we met what time was it and walk back and we'd have... Uh, we'd wrestle on the boundary and things like that. My father threw his leg over the boundary one day and caught us. So you were like the Cray twins going around yourself. <laughs> yeah, he was He was evil. i tell you what, let's hear from evil Ray right now. You're serious. I'm glad to take part in this concern of Frank Fury. He's one of the soundest men you will ever, ever meet. Him and I go back a long way. We, I think we started school together at three years of age or three and a half years of age or whatever. But ever since then, we've been friends. We worked together, we were involved in football together. There are a lot of funny incidents that happened. Some of them I can't, I can't tell you, but there's, there's a couple in particular. Years ago, we were, all, we were altar boys, believe it or not. Back then, you had the kiss on the cross on Good Friday, and him and I were paired together at, at the altar. One of the uh, altar boys had to hold the cross, and the other one had to have a piece of a cloth which wiped the feet after everybody kissing the feet. So anyway, everything was going grand and this elderly, elderly woman was almost there and she was half tripped coming over to the altar and her, her um, dentures half fell out and she put them back in really quick. So I said to Frank, look, at this woman has gone, just check how many fingers you have left. So <laughs> he burst out laughing and I think my father Conlon had pulled them on side on the altar and had a few words with him. But uh, we progressed it to where uh, we got up to soccer club in 66 and we developed it up to and including when the, we use the name of Goodbody Soccer Club. We, we, uh, we had two teams running, but we needed to raise funds in a different way rather than selling tickets or whatever. So Frank came up with the idea of a drama festival. We advertised it in the local papers. But we got applications from, I don't know if I got one, Captain Curran, who were, were very good. And a couple of other places, but there was one entrance from County Mead. And there were, at, the, at that particular time, there were practicing doing a play called Big Maggie. They looked to come down to see the broken hall and see what the setup was. And they were sort of semi-professional, but there was a, the director, he wore a cravat, a check jacket with the, with the a leather patched elbows. And he was looking all around the place and he said, well, he wanted to know the depth of the stage, the width of the stage, what the dressing room was like. And he said to Frank and myself, what are the acoustics like? And of course, Frank and I looked away, we happened to clue what he was talking about. And Frank said, excuse me, what did you say there? He said, well, what are the acoustics like? And so Frank says, well, we got to were here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great man to organise everything. You know, he was, he was the Greenfield League and that developed into the office school boys. He ended up, he fought his way into uh, to become the National Secretary of the School Boys Football Association of Ireland. Because everything was based in Dublin, so he got in and he moved different things around. He had even had we had an international match in Ireland and Greece in the Tullamore Harriers, which would never have happened had, had he not got in. He's a very determined type of man, and you could depend your life on him. So now there's the Ray Horn for you. He must have had drink. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely drunk. <laughs> um, kissing it across. Yeah, I think it was the first to be thrown out of the serving the mass. <laughs> that was just a problem I had. I couldn't stop laughing, and he could sit. See, he, he was angelic looking. He had white, curly, blondy hair. People liked him. He was very likable. And there was a devil there that nobody could see. I suffered because of him. <laughs> he left school and he went to work in Johnny Hanamy's. And he worked diligently. Now, diligently. 
a trainer to be a petrol pump attendant. <laughs> And he wore a collar and tie. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you meet the lovely Rose? The 15th of July, 1967, in the Star. And the countryman were playing. Was it love at first sight then, Frank? <laughs> For me it was. She uh, made several attempts to uh, go into a witness protection programme. <laughs> 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 of course, you got married then, Frank, and you weren't long married, and Frank got sick of Rose and headed off to America. Isn't that right? Yeah, no, it took me 10 years. <laughs> like, I, we met in uh, 67. It was 77 when we got married. Right, that was quite a long, uh, yeah, long engagement. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It lasted a fortnight at a time, and then three months of a departure when she was all finding somebody else. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. He's not bitter over this, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to... Um, I went to work for Burlington in Tullamore and we were sent to America, to North Carolina, for uh, training. It was incredible. It was just incredible. And you know when you go out of the town or it's your first experience after leaving school, you start to experience things like, geez, I'm not as dumb as I thought I was or I can learn or I'm as sharp as anybody around so, Right. Were you ever thinking, like, when you went to North Carolina, probably your first time away, you know, mm. I could make a go of it here, or was that ever in your head? Yeah, I got, I got two particular job offers. Uh, like, I got involved with the high school and I was coaching them in soccer. You couldn't become a member of the faculty in, in, in North Carolina unless you had a teacher's degree. So they offered to send me to teacher training college, and I would continue to coach the name. And, and the next one was uh, another guy offered me a job as director of, rec of recreation with his company in uh, North Carolina. So was there ever a call to Rose? Rose, would you would you like to come over to, to America? Well, the truth was I was dying to get home. See, you can leave Clara a million times, but Clara never leaves you. You know, so you never you never leave Clara, and you're always. Like, my thing was always to get back. I get a soccer club to run. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Mm. Back then, even, it was still a huge oh. part of it. It was a, draw, a very big draw for you. Yeah, it was a drug. It was, um, it started around 1966 and it never left. It Like, most people get cured from stuff like this. Right. It's a drug. It's just, I absolutely love the game and I love coaching. Okay, well, hold that thought for a moment then. So, you moved to the green then, all right? Yeah. Our first house was in the green, yeah. We bought uh, our first house in the green. It was number 24. And we were in it for 13 and a half. Incredibly happy days. Now, the difference between then and now is this. We lived with no lock on our back door for 13 and a half years and went on holidays every year. We had incredible neighbours. In particular, Peggy Dygan. I don't know if you know Peggy Dygan. Peggy Dygan and Peter Dygan lived just in front of us. So anytime we had nothing, we went over to Peggy Dygan and made sure she had something. So right. incredible neighbours. Let's take a little look back from one of your sons, Bobby. And he tells us a little bit about your DIY skills, Frank. Hi, Lloyd. Uh, thanks a million for interviewing our dad. Big fans of the podcast and uh, very, very proud of our dad. Dad is a fantastic father. He's a fantastic grandfather, father-in-law. He's a great friend. Very, very supportive of anything we've ever asked of him, for, anything ever we wanted to achieve. And he, he'd always give you 100%. But a memory growing up was he'd always help anyone. I remember people calling to the door, ringing them, or he was always helping people with CVs, application forms, any kind of a problem they ever had, and getting them ready for interviews or anything, giving them lifts. Very, very supportive, very, very generous man. Very, very proud of him for that. He's struggling big time with COVID because, as, as you're well aware yourself, like, like everyone gets a hug. And uh, that's, you know, it's not really accepted these days. But whether you want a hug or not, you've probably got a hug off Frank Fury at some stage, if, you, if you've lived in Clara at all. Probably the most useless man in Clara that ever attempted DIY, though. One story we were, we were thinking about him there was hilarious. He, when we were living in the green, we were only young, and uh, the TV was to the front of the house. And he, he decided in his wisdom that the TV should go to the back of the house. Um, the aerial for the TV was a long cable aerial that came in the front window. He decided in his wisdom that he'd tie it to a rock and he'd just throw the rock over the house. I remember it was a real sunny day and we were all playing and the Scullies and the Brackens and Kellys and 
O'Brien's and everybody was out. And next thing, a kind of small crowd gathered around to watch this magnificent feat. Well, he threw the rock and it sailed over the house. And uh, the problem was the, the rock, the cable stayed uh, connected to the rock. And when the cable fully extended, um, it started, it brought the rock down. And all everybody heard was a big, huge smash then when the rock smashed through the back window, the large back window, the, the sitting room. The laughs of everyone. And Daddy did what Daddy generally does is he needs a bit of time out. So he probably walked 10 miles around Chapel Hill that night, that day. And when he came down then, he came down and he's the first man to make a joke about it and laugh about it. And we still laugh about it today. We're very, very proud of our dad. Um, and thanks a million for interviewing him, Lloyd. Now, Frank, that was Bobby. Your DIY skills leave a lot to be desired. What have you got to say about that? Bobby lives in Westmead, so you, you have to make allowances. <laughs> I, I, th- I think I only broke one window. <laughs> now, in fairness, Bobby, I, I, I transferred all my DIY skills onto Bobby. His hands are on back, best too. <laughs> so that was the green. He also had, he had a shop in River Street then as well after that. Another house, Frank. He moved around a bit. <laughs> well, we were 13 and a half years in the green and... We were trying to build an extension to our house. Now, you you will probably find this odd or, or difficult to believe, but it was more expensive to do it than to build a house. For some reason, I forget the reasons, but I remember we talked about having to build a house. So we moved, we rented a house in River Street. It had a shop attached, and we decided to open a shop. Now, that decision was made over at least... At least 10 minutes went into that decision. Right. And uh, <laughs> I, was getting, I was getting phone calls from Rose in work, and she was saying, Jesus, there's another van here. There's another van, and it's full of stuff. <laughs> we, we opened with a biscuit tin. We didn't have a till. And it was brilliant. It was a huge success. How long were you there for, Frank? Five years. So, uh, Frank, I, I would put you down as a... D. Clara man. But D. Clara man then moved to Ballycumber. Now, I said to you earlier, you never leave Clara. Clara never leaves you. You know, like, you could not buy a site in Clara. So we ended up buying a site in, in uh, Ballycumber. So accepted with open <coughs> arms in Ballycumber, Frank, to this day? I wouldn't think so, no. I, I don't think to realise what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, st- you're still a blowing. <laughs> I'm absolutely a blowing. <laughs> How do you be a soccer head in Ballycombe, for God's sake? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true anyway. Frank Fury, talk to me about your working life. You were going home from school one day, but you didn't get the whole way home, did you? No, um, recruitment in Good Bullies was uh, through the nurse's office in the canteen. So I went in one day, going home from school, put down my name, and was with Nurse Halligan. And two days later, I started cutting treads in Good Bullies. Right. That was fairly quickly now. Two days home from school. What did yeah. your, your mother and father make of all this? I'd say it was the worst row that was ever in the house. It was the worst time for me with my mother and father that I really let them down and they were very upset. My mother was roaring. She was really upset. But I just dreaded school. I hated the thoughts of doing a, a group cert and getting an apprenticeship. I knew I didn't want that. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want that. What did your mother want you to do? She wanted me to be an apprentice carpenter. She had it arranged. So you think you, you let your mam down, that's what you... Oh, big time. Oh, big time. It was either that or the whole carpentry shop in Gubbley's would have closed down because I would have set them on fire or... <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't, none of them would have been speaking to her. Talk to me briefly then about the, the different stages then of your working career. You finished in the factory then in 67, that uh, you yes. made redundant. Mm. Was that a bit of a shock after leaving school and all that? No, no. I never suffered shock. You know, I, uh, like I, I took everything like I rolled with it and nothing bothered me like that. I, I had always confidence that I could earn a living. I was always sure of that. Right, so you had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit about you, would you say? Yeah. Uh, this is going to sound very patronising, but when you're reared in Clara, when you when you grow up in Clara, you don't doubt yourself. You just, you see all this around you. We were reared with incredible organisations all around us. And it just rubbed off on you. Good buddies rubbed off on me big time. I thought good buddies were brilliant. 
Give me some memories of good buddies, maybe the people that were there. Who were you cutting treads for? Johnny Walsh. Johnny Walsh should go straight to heaven. Johnny Walsh had to suffer me a smoker, a cheeky snot. Johnny Walsh was an athlete. Himself and Andy Duffy used to, to train religiously and diligently and were very determined to eat well. I was just a snot. You everything there working in their eyes. Oh, God. <laughs> Do you know, I'd say Johnny Walsh must have prayed at night time because there was no way he could face coming in to be with me the next day. But we were really close friends and we stayed close friends. We're still close friends. I remember my father telling me on his podcast about the factory horn and the canteen and that. Could take us through? What was it? What stands out for you? Oh, the smells. The smell of going past the, uh, the Loden Bay. The noise going past the weaving, like you'd hear the shuttles beating up and down the, the bed. And the smell of tar. Some uh, sewn was done with tar twine, and you could smell that. And when I was in Gubbadies, I remember the tea horn coming around, and Johnny Mullins was in charge of it. I really envied him his job. It was just pushing this around. And you put your mug in, and it didn't matter whether you took sugar or milk, you got it. It was uh, just memories, just fabulous memories. Progressing on to that then, Frank, I just, I'm trying to get to, when were you, I suppose, best happy in a job or in your career? Was it coaching people, not with soccer, but coaching people yeah. in, in life skills and that? Yeah, always working with people. Working, oh, this is going to sound so wrong, but it's working with people who were less well off than you or more disadvantaged than you, whether it was a physical or mental or disability or whether they were, they just didn't get a great break at the start of life. You know. Was there a sense of fulfilment for you helping them people out? Oh, an amazing. It's an amazing satisfaction to, to know that you could help somebody. You know, it's just a, a fabulous feeling to know that you turn things around or you help to turn things around for somebody. A lot of people wouldn't know, Frank, that you actually worked in the Dangan Reformatory for some time as a member of staff there. How did that come about? Somebody came to us, I think it was Joe Stanley, and said to us, they were looking for a game and would we play them in a game. So we arranged a game for under 14 or something. And then we had tea and sandwiches for them afterwards in the canteen in Gubbity's. And it was... A great conversation, you know, it was like we had all the kids were all sitting at more or less the same tables. There weren't, we didn't have Dangan kids and Clara kids. And then when the staff asked us, would we go over and help out some light with training? And I developed out that. I ended up working over there. What was that like, Frank? Just remember now, I wasn't a kid locked up and I was a staff member and I could come and go. The kids were brilliant. They were just brilliant kids. I never had the experience of working with a kid that I didn't like or they couldn't learn or couldn't develop or couldn't improve. I had loads and loads and loads of kids who weren't taught properly. Like I had a lot of influence. If I could influence a kid to do his group cert at the time, when the group cert was over, he'd be let home. So like you, you were always selling this idea. Frank, go back for a second. <clears throat> How did someone like yourself, who hated school, was now selling the idea of education to guys in the reformatory in Dangan? Was it just your wish for them to just get out of here? Just yeah. Let's say they were going to get three years. So they could be out there in a year. I see what you mean. Well, it was certainly uh, fascinating. It must have been a fascinating and different place to work. Of course, Frank, you worked in lots of places. In Burlington, you were a supervisor in Tullamore. And then, of course, you're back to Bopa again. Where to from there, Frank? After that, I worked in rehab in Tullamore for 10 years with people with additional needs. I had a group of 27. My job was basically to, to get enough work for uh, sort of occupational therapy for my, my gang. And I was kind of successful at it. I was able to bring in loads of work. But one of the contracts I had was for a company in Borough called LD Intercon. Then I heard they were looking for uh, a HR officer. I applied. And they offered me the job. I'm just trying to get a sense to where you were more comfortable. You were helping people. Was that it for you? If you were helping people, you were happy. That sounds really 
No, I'm not that nice of a fellow at all. <laughs> no, I'm trying to paint a good picture. <laughs> yeah. No, I liked, you know, like, I like a job that is similar to coaching. I like the fact that you can persuade somebody to be the best they can be. That's a great feeling. I think at one stage I realised I had 13 jobs when I was about 30. I ended up in Foss in Athlone for 10 years. I wrote a course and I delivered it on career planning. It was designed for people who dropped out of school early or might have had a substance abuse problem or wouldn't have had a good break in life. It was incredibly successful. It was just brilliant. At what part of your life did soccer take over? Probably on a Saturday evening, Saturday night, match of the day. Uh, it was on BBC. Horns had a BBC aerial. And myself and Joe Evers used to go to Horns on a Saturday night, drink tea, eat homemade uh, Madeira cake. Then we'd wait for match of the day and the reception would always break down. Every now and again, you got to, you got to see someone like George Best. And it was an amazing thing. It was like somebody seen the Beatles. He was just amazing. So that's basically where it started then. Jack Kelly, when I was working in Good Buddies, <laughs> all the fitters, all the mechanics had their own workbench. And Jack Kelly's was wallpapered with Celtic posters. Celtic were a major club in Scotland. There were two major clubs themselves and Rangers. They were real rivals. You know, they were even enemies. So in 1967, Celtic won the first uh, European Cup. And they were known as the Lisbon Lions. But their manager was a guy called Jack Stein. But their assistant manager was another guy called Sean Fallon. And Sean Fallon was a first cousin of Tom Fallon's in Kilcorsing. So a Celtic connection to Clara. With Clara, absolutely. Now, an amazing connection. And as assistant manager, he actually took over managing at one stage when Jack Stein became ill. There also is a connection between Tom Fallon and the Fallon family with Sligo Rovers. Irony of all this was one of the first kids that started to come through in soccer with me in the Greenfield League was a kid called John Tierney, who was Tom Fallon's grandson. He was just a great kid. That's amazing. It's amazing. I wonder if there are a lot of people in Clara listening to this now knew about that Celtic connection. And of course, then back to John Tierney as well. Actually, let's hear a little bit from John Tierney now. John Tierney. Delighted to send a quick message to yourself and Frank today. When I think of Frank Lloyd, I think of some of the happier times in Clara growing up, in particular playing football and the Greenfield League. It was always very well organised and it was like a World Cup final every week and all the lads around my age would have nothing but fond memories of those games and those times in the Greenfield, playing with our friends, kicking lumps out of each other and Frank definitely had his hands full trying to keep everyone happy. But one of the things I can remember about Frank is when we started to play competitive football, he always encouraged us that we could be as good as any of the bigger clubs or the so-called bigger players around the Midlands. But most importantly, we had to believe it ourselves. And that's, that's always a nice thing to hear when you were younger. And it was great that we had someone who believed in us at an early age. And now Frank has become a very good friend over the years, Lloyd. And I was very grateful to him personally when I came home from America after finishing the scholarship. As soon as I got home, he was the first person on to me, asking me what I wanted to do next. And he was straight on to Pat Byrne, who was the manager of Shamrock Rovers at the time. And sure enough, he had me up with them the following week, no messing about. And in general, I think Frank always kept a genuine interest in all the lads that would have played for him when we were younger. He was happy to see us all doing well, which was, which was always nice, but... Now it's always lovely to see Frank when I'm home, as he's always in good form and good for a quick laugh. So please pass on my warmest regards, Lloyd, to Frank and to everyone at home in Clara. John Tierney there. Wow. John's in America. <laughs> <laughs> we got the phone in in Raheen, Frank, a while ago. That's excellent. You know, like we had Northern Water when I was in Raheen, so. <laughs> so there's John. John, of course, went on to, to, to huge success in America <clears throat> playing, playing soccer. Yeah, he's a lovely lad. No, a lovely lad. He had a hunger and a passion to play and to succeed. And he was probably one of the easiest to coach. He wasn't the most skillful. Like very few are that are successful. You, you don't have to be, it has to be a hunger. 
Ray mentioned uh, in his little piece there, in 1966 he started Good Buddies AFC. Uh, straight away he won the Town League, I believe that. That must have been unbelievable, of course. That was a, we know who won the World Cup that year as well. So take it up from there, Frank, 1966. Yeah, I don't think England got the same reception as we did. And um, like It was a Town League in Tullamore. It was an underage Town League. And the team was managed by Frank Simpson, Sonny Rickard, Sonny Kelly, Bill Rickard, and about 22 others. Uh, the team was brilliant. It was great. Out of that, we formed the soccer club properly. It was mostly in the hands of the older guys, like the likes of Sonny Rickard. And the, they were the ones, and uh, Brendan Kennedy. A couple of months into it, Brendan Kennedy came to myself and Martin Devine and Ray Horn and asked us to form a supporters club because they weren't able to finance it because they were playing in the AUL in Dublin. We formed a supporters club and we started to run dances in Goobity's Canteen on a Saturday night. It was a major success. It funded the soccer club. It kept us going. The following year down at the AGM, we became the committee. Money didn't stay very long. When you had to hire a bus every week, like a football, I remember at the time, was an enormously expensive buy a football and if you lost a football sure it was the same as losing a kidney it was like there was a meeting over it we then ran the uh, indoor football in the Star and that was fantastically successful that was brilliant I was the chairman of the club I was 16 or 17 Tommy O'Hara was treasurer because he could count Brendan Kennedy was secretary he, he could spell I couldn't do either so I was uh, basically Good at talking, and that was it. <laughs> That's why I was German. I marked the pitches. Frank, take me on to the Greenfield League. The Greenfield League was probably the biggest thing to ever hit Clara <laughs> on a Saturday and a Wednesday during the summer. Some might say that the summer holidays couldn't begin unless the Greenfield League was done. People had to change holiday plans and everything. Where did the Greenfield League start? I asked Johnny Scully this recently enough. You know, we, uh, Johnny Scully and I. And Tommy O'Hara started it. I think it started because Tommy O'Hara and Johnny Scully were running the community games kids soccer team. But they were never able to get a squad together. Like the team nearly picked itself because you knew someone, he knew someone. And we always knew, we all knew that there were kids really good and talented in Clara. And it wasn't organised. So the three of us started it. Tommy O'Hara had a... A very tough, stressful job in the Midland Health Board at the time. So he wasn't able to get there every night. Best he could get there was some Saturday. So myself and Johnny more or less ran it. But Tommy was always supportive and always there. So we ran on Tuesdays, Taurus's and Saturdays. I mean, just, uh, just uh, some of the memories I have here for, from uh, a couple of people. Mark having a great memories of the Greenfield League and Frank Fury. Done more for the game than anyone else in the Midlands. Brought myself and others and Clara from the Greenfield League to play for an awfully team that played for an Irish schoolboys team. Jack Monaghan, those were the days and great crowds too. I remember Brian Kerr made his way down for the, mer- the medal ceremony. Barry McKeown, coming up from Cork, always felt welcome to play in the Greenfield League. Played over a few summers and Frank Fury fr- uh, was from Dublin. He would be head of the FAI. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, just Barry. reiterating there what Barry said, I mean, I never played football. Useless, two left feet, but I played in the Greenfield League every year, and it was brilliant because it was so inclusive. Yeah, and I felt good because you were looking at the teams. Oh, brilliant! John Newman, a striker, great. Mm. We're going to get a couple mm. of Ray, Ray, Ray Fitzpatrick was in goal or something yeah. like that, you know. But like it was for me who never played football to look forward to playing football. How? Mm. What was the? How did that happen? That you would get guys like me who can't play football excited about playing football. Johnny and I uh, ran this. We never had a word. We never, like, I'm, I I get the credit for this, but there were two of us doing this. You know, like, Johnny Scully was a fabulous um, sound of board. You know, like, you, you would, but for example, how we select the teams. None of us, neither he nor I, nor Tommy O'Hara, had a child uh, playing in the Greenfield League when we started this. So this was going on for about five years before we had kids coming on. We advertised it. We had all the kids down in in, uh, the Greenfield and we assessed them. Now, this sounds awful, but we would assess them on whether he was an eight or a seven or a six or a five. And if it was a seven aside team, we would then make sure that the total assessment was equal on each team. 
So you might be a nine on a team. This team might have an eight, but it could have two sevens. You know, so what, what our aim at all times was to get fair balance yeah. on the team. Because teams. it was very balanced. All yeah. the teams were very well laid out. Yeah. You know, uh, and the uh, competition was equal, I would have mm-hmm. thought. No, in fairness, it was. And when it wasn't, you'd have people complaining to you. That's not fair. But that's going to happen at every... Yeah, but the truth was, if it wasn't fair, it was because some kids didn't show up. If your team showed up in full, seven, and my team had five, we wouldn't ask you to drop two of your team. So seven played against five. Eight, uh, seven could play against four. You never dropped a kid to make up for the ones who didn't show up. Mm-hmm. That was one, and that worked for us. The other thing was to always start before the school holidays started. Then you had all the conversation in the school. And then we took over uh, Galvin's window, Mona Galvin's window. We that was a, a famous home. thing now, mm. going down to Mona Galvin's, oh, yeah. seeing where you're Real Madrid, yeah. Bayern Munich. <laughs> yeah. And did you know we never had Liverpool or Man United? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We didn't have them because too many kids would have been offended if there were Liverpool supporters playing for United. So we had to do an awful lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of psychology in this. Well, Frank, speaking of psychology now, there's a poor lad here, Niall Keegan, he's up the road from us, and he says, <laughs> I was so SH1T <laughs> at soccer <laughs> that Frank made me linesman and gave me the nickname, Hind the Line. <laughs> so it's a public apology. <laughs> well, no. Uh, he was one of those kids that was full of enthusiasm but he was also afflicted with the fact that his brother Gary was a gifted footballer okay so Niall was much younger so Niall was too young so we used to he used to do the line and like you'd be refereeing and you would come down on the line you send people can you stay back behind the line and then he started to say to people behind the line behind the line so we gave him a bib <laughs> With a hind the line written on it. So he was the official linesman. And he was just a super, super child. As happy a kid as you could imagine. Brilliant. Another few messages in from Adrian Berry. Great memories from the Greenfield League. Goal we keeper. were Bayern Munich. I also played in goals for Clara back in the day. And Frank was a great coach and great crack and absolute gent. Gary Fitzpatrick, a million memories from the Greenfield League and all good ones. Joe Keyes, brilliant memories in the Greenfield League. <laughs> Also, Jimmy Taylor, great memories, and it was the highlight of the summer. Stephen Kelly, hundreds of memories, all unreal. And he was speaking to a man that had a uh, part in the pathway to playing soccer for under eights, the senior soccer, for hundreds of players in the town. Every summer, you couldn't wait to see what team you were on. Actually, let's hear from one more guy, another gifted footballer indeed, who never missed a night, Finian Morn. Hello, Lloyd. Wow. Finian Morn here. Thanks very much for asking me to say a few words about Frank Ferry and the Greenfield League back in the 80s. Certainly, the summer couldn't start unless there was a trip made down to Galvin's to see the players you were with and the players you were against. But as soon as the football started in the greenfield, Frank had a great group of lads with him, the likes of Johnny Scully, Joe Bracken and Ray Horn. And week in, week out, the goals were out, the pitch was lined, the bibs were on and even the bottles of water were out. And every player was looked after, no matter what their ability or what skill, and fair play to Frank and the gang on a wonderful, successful tournament every year, the likes we'll probably never see again. So, well done, Frank, and great success. You can still hear the passion in Finian Moran's voice there. The bibs are on, the water bottles are out, ready for he water. He was exceptional. He was, <laughs> he was a very grateful father. But if I met his mother now, Eileen, she'd say to me, Lord, the names Finnan used to call you because <laughs> because you didn't put him on, you didn't make him a captain, or you didn't, you know, he didn't like the name of his team or something. But she told me, even now, if I met her in the street, she'd say, "Ah, oh, the names Finnan used to call you." <laughs> Finnan Morn was a gift. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you'd remember him playing. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, there were so Great many. Football. There was another one called uh, Ian Fitzpatrick. Mm-hmm. Ian Fitzpatrick. I have, a, have a picture of Ian Fitzpatrick here in front of me, actually. And he's with Maura Maher, Brian Kerr. I'm sort of getting a medal here, and that's... John O'Hara. John O'Hara. So there's a little memory there for anyone. Yeah. It's on the Facebook page, Little Town Media, if anybody wants to have a look at that. So, Frank, but to sum it up, why was the Greenfield League so special? And, I mean, it, it was a... 
it was a group thing. There was people working, I suppose, mm. like of Derek Daly and uh, Barbara Evers working, getting things organised and everything. Huge organising aspect of that, wasn't it? The government had introduced a student summer job scheme uh, at some stage. So we applied for it. So we were able to hire the likes of, of second level students, uh, Sean Greville, Noel Gavin, all those guys. And they were great. We tried every year to improve it. Like Johnny and I would meet and sit and talk about what went wrong. What can we do better? So you were always trying to oh, get yeah. better. Yeah, we were never satisfied. Like, I'll give you people who were never mentioned. <laughs> there was a man called Jerry Roach. Your father would remember Jerry. Lived Roach. across the road from us. And Absolutely. Green, yeah. Jerry Roach was a market gardener at times. We used to borrow tools from him. You visualise me with those instruments. And then you see Johnny Scully, who was of equal skills, but was nobody <laughs> as bad as Tommy O'Hara. Like, he was worse than the two of us. <laughs> but we broke everything we got from Jerry Roach. And then names he'd call me. <laughs> I broke his groper. Now, like, you don't do things And he was like, a gifted gardener, Jerry oh, Roach. Oh, he was. The place was unbelievable. Then Eileen Hughes across, she would give us tea. Every kid in the place went to that door looking for water. Dalton's on top of the green, they house the goalpost. Everybody remember, where are these goalposts gone? Mm. They steal the goalposts. Yeah. <laughs> they are in, uh, then they were behind the barracks, the guard station. I have those goalposts at home. Do you know where they came from? That's a museum piece now. <laughs> yeah. <Frank. laughs> they were, Michael McEwan was the engineer in the poly factory in Clara. And the centre of the beams was made of, of aluminium. They were aluminium tubes. And he gave me two or three or four of them to make goalposts from. It needed uh, an arc welder to make them. So we'd bring them to Cochrane Engineering and Tullamore, and they made them. The trophies, the likes of Billy Bracken, Slobby Rickard, fellas who won trophies every year in five-a-side or seven-a-side or indoor football, would give me their trophies. I'd bring them into Tom Kane and Tullamore. We'd change the centre on them, change the plate on them, and we had new trophies then come back out. And we ran a bill at Tom Kane, so we used to pay him off every week. Our bibs were made out of scraps from, uh, it was a sewing factory in Tullamore. And we got the ends of their of their cuts. A male larrikey, Ballinot, she, she made them into bibs for us. You just milked anyone there. Like Frank Mulligan was always our fallback position when we when we owed more than we could ever expect to be able to pay. Getting the petrol for the lawnmowers, we'd walk up and down that pitch a hundred times cutting this with small hand mowers from from your own house, you know. But from all of that, you gave so many young guys, well, my generation and, of course, further generations, so many memories and they're telling their own sons about this. I mean, it was unbelievable. For somebody like yourself and Johnny Scully, Tommy Hart organised this. Was but it sounds like it was an onerous task. It sounds like it was a huge job. I can tell you, no child got as much pleasure of it as Tommy O'Hara, as Johnny Scully, myself. We never did an hour in the Greenfield over 19 years that we didn't love. Like, like hiring the band, getting the band to march up through the town for the final, introducing the individual players one by one, and they get <laughs> applause. And you had to tell them, you have to go ahead to the centre circle and wave at the crowd. But there was a certain FA Cup final moment about oh, it, wasn't yeah, there? It, yeah. it was a big deal. Yeah. And for kids to get that experience of a big mm. final, you know, maybe mm. someone might have never have played in a final ever again. Yeah. But the Greenfield League was certainly up there. Another uh, memory from Farrell Cornley. I played with Frank <laughs> when he was the main man with the CPR soccer team in the town. We played in the Longford League and he would be fined a pound if you showed up for your boots not polished, he says. Yeah, Farrell, where's all them pounds? <laughs> Farrell was difficult to get a pound of. <laughs> you mean and, the boots clean? <laughs> and he only came once without po polishing them. <laughs> Farrell Cornley was then and is now one of life's gentlemen. He was just a good guy. Frank, who do you, in your in your opinion, I know it's a it's a tough ask, but who was maybe the best all rounder football player that you've seen playing for Clara? God, there were so many. There really are so many. But my honest opinion now, and he's a close friend, but my honest opinion, the best footballer produced in Clara for his vision, for his speed, 
for his ability to get forward, to defend. He had a fabulous engine, was Billy Brecken. Then you had Ray Horn. Ray Horn was an exceptionally good footballer. He went to play with St. Pat's in Dublin and St. Patrick's was letting. He was excellent. He was a gifted player, but all rounders were really good players. Goalkeepers, Martin Vaughan was an excellent goalkeeper. One of the guys that stands out for me that didn't play for long enough uh, was Johnny Redmond. Johnny Redmond, I thought, was an incredible footballer. But he, he was in love with music as well, so he, he, he stayed in, in music. Tommy Redman one time tried to teach me how to play the guitar, and he told me uh, to put one finger, only, no, only one finger on, on a string. And I said, I only have one finger on. <laughs> so uh, he gave up on that. <laughs> Frank, you talked a lot about the, the male players in the game from Clara and the good players. Was there, was there must have been good female players as well. There was one player who was better than any lad, was probably the best player ever to come out of Clara. And I think she went on to play for Arsenal. And it was Catherine Hines from Marion Square. She was different class. She was incredible. Easily the best to ever come out of Clara. Frank, you're also involved in bringing Ireland and Greece to the Harriers in Tullamore. How did that come about? And of course, some famous players made their debuts that day as well. Des Casey was, in, uh, was one of the executives of the FAI. And he rang me one day and he said, I was secretary of the SFAI. And he said, uh, Greece had approached him for a game for their under 16. I took it and I placed it in Tullamore. I brought the manager down, showed him facilities. Now it was in the Tullamore Harriers Stadium. And it was beautiful. It was magnificent. The late Tony Alban was the referee. It was a huge success. We had James Heine from Fabian, Hugh Carlin from Port Harrington at the time. They played at the, on the Irish under 16s. A young lad from Cork also made his debut in uh, Tullamore that day. Uh, he was on the bench. He was Roy Keane. So, <laughs> it worked. Frank, unfortunately, we're getting close to running out of time, but I just want to talk to you briefly about talent shows. <laughs> the Midland Entertainer of the Year. Yeah. And then there was one in the Michael League in Sports. I was actually in that one myself. Myself, Billy Meehan and Damien Scally. I think we came second. Vision 3 or someone won it from Eden Derry. I can't remember. No, Vision 3 from Terrell's Pass. Get the Terrell's come on, Pass. Come on, Terrell's Pass. <laughs> Incidentally, the first one we ran was in, uh, was in the Mill House, which uh, John Tierney's father was the uh, joint owner. The likes of Paddy Horn, Jojo Bracken, Dahi Rua, but a girl from Oat, a little a little timid girl from Oat, won it. Her name was Kathleen Duffy and she sang Paper Roses. She yeah. was amazing. The Entertainer of the Year in, in Michael Egan's was brilliant. Mm. Its success was because we paid professional adjudicators. Every week we had a guest judge, but we had a permanent chairman. It was before its time, really. It was oh, like well, X Factor. Yeah, now, it was. With the judges there yeah. and everything. Everything was. And, and you got your comments after yeah. it and everything. He had to do his critique on the stage. That became the highlight. That became. Uh, but I remember a Clara group not winning one night. And the mothers tackled me. <laughs> Probably my mother, wasn't it? <laughs> no. Your mother was making the sandwiches. <laughs> no, it was, it was just. But the tension. But we had two outstanding groups from Eden Derry. One was called The Cross. They were only young guys, mm-hmm. and they were excellent. And the one that won it were known as Etoile. Etoile were, are now called, I think, Midnight Blue. The standard was incredibly high, and it was dead honest. We <laughs> did all of those things to make money, and we never made a ball. We were the most <laughs> useless shower that you could put together. Did you play music yourself, Frank? Oh, Brilliantly. No, I, I was a gifted accordionist. Actually, I have a, a piece of audio here of Frank Fury playing the accordion. Everybody, I want you to have a little listen to this. Wow, Frank. You are shocked, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I am twice as shocked. I'll tell you a story about the accordion. Ray Horn had a Paolo Soprano double couplet, right? Very expensive. The kind of thing that only good musicians should have. Now, what he was doing with it, I don't know. But I used to try and steal it out when I was over in his house and play it. 
So I was sitting on the stairs one day, playing, do re mi mi mi. And his mother was at the front door chatting Biddy Hawk, and she excused herself with Biddy Hawk, and she came back into the stairs and she said, Will you come into the kitchen, Gosling, and kiss on your things? That's Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> we also have another little piece of audio here from a, a guy you drove around the country. Cut me down your price. <laughs> it is. Frank, there's fierce rumours going around, Clara, that you fired me from Undone. Um, I'm going to have to uh, stand up for myself and say that that's not the truth. I left willingly. Thank you very much, Frank, for um, for all those years. We had some great times. The murderous arguments were definitely outweighed by the good times and last we've had visiting all the chippers and taking in a few gigs along the way. Um, it was Derek that was the ringleader and he was definitely the bad influence on me and I'm sticking to that. Frank, I have huge admiration and respect for you. You're one in a million. You have a different understanding of kids than most people and I'll never forget it to this day. I wish you and Rosie all the best and health and happiness. And Frank, I love you, son. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot his name. <laughs> Danny, you did sack me. You, you sacked me when, as soon as the van was paid for, you sacked me. <laughs> so, Frank, you're, you're a grandfather now, obviously. Uh, well, yeah. no, obviously, you don't really look like a grandfather, in fairness. You kept your, uh, your youthful appearance. <laughs> <laughs> That's D Danny Price's influence. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a little uh, question here from your granddaughter, Lizzie. Oh, Lizzie. Hi, Granddad, it's Lizzie here. <laughs> the grandchildren love you so, so much. But we have one question. Where are we going to go for Penny Sweets now that Kenny's is closed? <laughs> <laughs> there are Kenny's is closed. Where are they going to get the Penny Sweets? I think there is a, there's definitely a commission to be set up and why that is closed. We need it open. <laughs> we need to get it back open. We need my, to get a petition. My, you know? my grandkids in that long call it Penny's. We're going to Penny's for sweets. But I couldn't realise it was Kenny's. There's somebody I want to mention. Like, we talk about soccer and about standards and why we did things so well. Like, the standard in Clara, we didn't do celebrity very well in Clara, but the standards in Clara were amazing. Like, you think of Tops at the Ham, you think of Clara Musical Society, you think of Duxy Dygan's drama group, the pick players, Rufina Rex, Richie Rex. They were amazing. The standard was, but in football, we had an incredible individual called Sean Kennedy, who was a beautiful fo footballer in his day, but an outstanding referee. If he was born in Dublin, he would have been a UEFA or a FIFA referee. Sean Kennedy was a major influence on soccer and Clare and on all of us. He was the type of guy that would not tolerate you having low standards. You talk about me charging a fellow for, for not polishing his boots. Sean Kennedy run you out of pitch <laughs> if you didn't get it right. Uh, I remember saying to him one time, how many rules are none? <laughs> and I said, Sean, you, there are none. There are laws in the game. But I was asking how many rules were there. Frank, in all your different ventures, you also ran for the council as well, didn't you? Twice. <laughs> I would be awful upset now if I hadn't done it. It was something I had to get out of my system. I, I needed to do it. And I wanted to do it. And I did it for uh, reasons that I thought were genuine. I just thought that there was so much I was trying to do in Clara at amateur level, you know, like with the Greenfield League and we needed a pitch and there was problems with park and there was problems. With, and I just thought that if I got a C on the council, I might be able to push the Clara agenda better. That is not to suggest that Derville wasn't or Barry wasn't. It was just, I just thought that I, I was coming from a different background. Your own take on it. Yeah. And uh, so I ran the first time as Independent and the second time as Fine Gael. And uh, I was totally unsuccessful. <laughs> you can fail, but uh, I fail mightily. Do you think in Clara, was it a case of right man, wrong party? Yeah. Uh, well, no. I think in Clara and in, small, in most towns, popular and being popular and being and popularity is valued very highly. And I'm not popular, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Frank, judging by all the messages here that we got into the show, that's certainly the total opposite. So, Frank, we're going to do a quick fire round. We normally do it at the end of each podcast. Are you ready for this? Absolutely. The first answer that comes into your head. Are you ready? Hmm. Frank Fury. First thing you'd buy if you won the lotto? 
pitch. What actor would play you in a film? Boris Karloff. First album you ever bought? Peace by Freshman. Best thing about Clara? Everything. What actress would play Rosie in a film? Uh, Bette Davis. First car you ever bought? Oh, Michael, Michael Sheridan's <laughs> Morris 1100. I went to him and I said to him, uh, I'm thinking of buying your car. It's been around Ireland twice. No, he didn't tell me it had no hope of getting around to the third time. <laughs> if you had one wish, what would it be? It started all over again. Your favourite TV show? Don't know. And Frank, the last question of the quick fire round. This is a game called Well Da. Okay. <laughs> Where you have to guess which one of your sons is saying Well Da. We have the three of them. You ready for this? Yeah. Here we go. Well Da. Well Da. Well Da. Derek said the last one. Bobby's the middle one and Lee's the first one. Hooray, applause, you got them right. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> so you know your sons fairly well. Oh, absolutely. We talk every day. We talk every day. They're, uh, we're really good friends. Frank, any any regrets in life? It wasn't long enough. <laughs> Frank, what do you think of Clara now? Clara is is different than, than the one I grew up in. But that's because Good Buddies is no longer there. And community is, doesn't seem to be as tight but it is still the most fabulous place in the world to live. Fabulously talented. You look at Vincent Devine, Shane Lowry. Look at Brian Cowan. You know, you don't, and we, we don't get affected by celebrity. Mm-hmm. We're, ju- we're just, because we were surrounded by tops of the town and success. Any advice, finally, Frank, for the younger generation growing up now? Drop your screens and see what's around you. Frank, as all the messages I received uh, have the same message, you've done so much for your town in various guises and we'd like to thank you for that. Uh, you're a very supportive person and uh, your family are very proud of you. Thanks for taking the time to chat me on the podcast. Thanks very much. I, I didn't want to do this. This was uh, I really didn't want to do this, but it was brilliant. You're a great chatter. Yeah, thanks but then you're much, a son Frank. of your father. <laughs> Frank, we're going to close out the podcast with a song that you have chosen before we started. It's obviously a song from a Clara artist that we're always trying to support here on the What's the Story podcast. So Frank, introduce it for us. This is a guy that was a personal friend, an incredible talent, a beautiful human being. Everything a man could ever need by Paddy Hall. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Looking back on the days when I was scuffling for a buck, I'd ever really concerned with life and love. I was always feeling sorry for myself and my bad luck. Never stopped to think what life's made of.
at Stodge Face, we take our baking seriously. And we're not talking about the Panny de Banana bread type baking. We're talking American style, original recipe, hard to come by, donut frying, cupcake styling baking. And we have done our research. Try it for yourself. We insist. Open weekdays from 10 a.m. and weekends from 12 p.m. We only close when the shelves have been emptied. We are currently located in Irish Town Athlone and our new Tullamore based venture is coming soon. So watch this space. We are people friendly, dog friendly and COVID friendly. We are Stodge Face.